Okay, so um, this is the roadmap on what did we need to know about single-use plastic, but it was also uh, so this is a, a challenge. We've we've been hearing this all today. Um, if we could go down the line and with a quick introduction again of what you're doing and uh, what do you think the super challenge is here because there's there's uh, d different definitions on this material or the uh, not the material but the, the way it's used maybe and how it's defined and what do you think that we collectively can do um, in this room given the different uh, policy ideas that are uh, potential outcomes for, for recovering this material is really the, the main challenge. Yeah, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, I'm Nagu, the name is very long in the, I'm Nagu, just call me Nagu. I'm from the Ministry of Environment, Energy, Science, Technology, Environment and Climate Change. Uh, Dato Lim said I'm the major architect, actually I'm not I'm probably the facilitator. It was drafted by huge amount of input, lots of uh, stakeholder input to draft the roadmap. I mean, on a serious note, um, there are many numbers that Malaysia is proud of. We are one of the best places to visit on this planet, but we are not happy to be the, one of the biggest polluter of plastic pollution. We are number eight in the mismanaged plastic pollution, so we are top 10. So we had to do something. Uh, we agree plastic is not the problem. Plastic is one of the best invention ever, I think but it's uh, trying to manage this issue. So if you look at our roadmap, and uh, unfortunately I can't, I'll give you the link. If you go to our ministry's website, it's up there. It's single-use plastic. It's a plastic if you use it once and you throw it away. But we know that together with this, there are many initiatives to bring plastic back into the economy. We heard a lot of speakers telling the circular economy, the wonderful work that Coke is doing on trying to big bottles back. So if you read our roadmap carefully, we are looking firstly on plastic bags and straws. Plastic bags have huge problems with them. So what we are saying is, we are not banning plastic bags. We just got a WhatsApp message this morning. I think many of you all know EU is planning to ban them. New Zealand has banned them. Many countries have banned them. What we are doing is, uh, we are trying to create a pollution charge uh, to educate public that you know if plastics, if you don't handle it properly, it pollutes the environment. So we are trying to get people to bring bags from home. So a pollution charge would be charged, and since Malaysia inherited a federal system of government, we've got 13 states, so we're trying to get every state on board, so we're giving them time until 2021 to charge this pollution charge on plastic bags. Straw is no by default, but we know there are members of the society who are differently able, which probably still need straws. So that is what we're planning to do. And uh, I know Dato Lim's kept on emphasizing all single-use plastics, well, for the first phase, we're looking only at plastic bags and straws. And as science progresses, in the second phase, we'll move to others, and we listed down a few. And we know we're not the only ones in the world doing that. There are many other countries. EU is doing that as well. So if plastics could come back to the economy, it will not be defined as single use. And it will, if it has got a second life. So I'll stop there, and I'll come back for more. Right. Hello. Um, I think to, you know, it's like when, when we have our solution, um, there are people coming to us asking, hey, you know, can you replace mineral water bottle with this? So, you know, it's like my point of view is we always start from what is the value of the product to the market. Okay, mineral water bottle is meant to last. Right? It is meant to sit on a retail shelf. It's meant to last a few years. So that value to the consumer is different. So, you know, it's like, as opposed to like food service where this is just um, a, a container that you eat your food in for the next 15 minutes and that's it. That's the use of its life. So I think um, it's very easy to entangle you know, plastics all into one and try to address it um, at one time. Uh, maybe a couple more examples like you know, um, hospitals. Hospitals switch to disposable for sterilization reasons. I don't think that's for a safety reason. I don't think we should take away that. And um, also, interestingly, uh, we have this customer, right? They run a canteen, right? So you guys will remember the 2002 SARS days. They switched over from washables to reusables because like, 
from washables to disposable uh, styrofoam plates for, sanit for san um, hygiene reasons. So, um, I mean, to that, I think we have to ask what is the value of you know, um, the product to the consumer first and whether or not you know, that uh, if it's more on the intangible value like convenience, you know, how far would consumer go before um, you know, it really handicaps the, the economy? Okay, I think here, we, I totally concur with what you've just stated. Um, convenience is just by itself uh, an idea, but convenience should not be at the expense of the environment. So the reason why plastics are used is because it provides convenience, but it is also our job to make sure we take care of the environment by making sure that, for instance, Ken, no, he's not in the room, um, the, 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 there's a difference between single use and single life. Okay? Now, if you are able to have single use but not a single life and it becomes a circular economy, it should not be a problem. Why is plastic is so prevalent in this world right now is because it is functionally still the material of choice. There's no doubt about that. It offers a lot of functional uh, benefits that is not possible if you look at biodegradable plastics. Now, I showed a chart just now where bioplastics is going to increase by 20% per year. But if you look again at the chart, you will find that out of the 100% of bioplastics, 57% is converted into non-degradable bioplastics, which means that there are more non-degradable bioplastics than degradable plastics, simply because of one reason, the functionality part of it. So plastics offer that solution, and uh, to find a solution to take away and replace it with something else, it is not something we believe is going to be achievable, uh, simply because if you look at bioplastics, it has been around for the last 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, up to now, it is still not the magic bullet. So we should address the more immediate issue is that stop the pollution leak and address the issue of waste management. I think that's the one that is more um, immediate in terms of uh, priority. Thank you. So my turn to answer the question. Uh, as, as a lecturer in the university, the answer is very simple. Education. I involved with this uh, landfill site in 1982, seriously. I'm doing research in, the, in Basilton, England. Until now, people are still talking about it, meaning that there are three or four things not being solved. Number one, we don't have enough education on it. Not aware, we don't practice well, and we don't develop technology to solve the problem. Then later now, we are talking 2018, in many celebration of uh, the day related to environment, World Environment Day, Earth Day, Wetland Day, whatever day, 2018, we are talking about plastic. Why plastic? Because plastic go into the ocean. Malaysia number eight, China number one, uh, Indonesia number two in Asia, and uh, uh, ASEAN Pacific, you know, Association of Parliamentary, whatever name, uh, ASEAN Member of Parliament meeting in Manila also talk about plastic. So meaning the plastic become an issue. Why? Because the pressure from naturalists, 100% of seabird eating or feeding their babies plastic. Many cases, their turtle died. Many cases of whales died. There are the plastic in there. And don't surprise, crocodiles also have plastic in there. My research, my survey using crow, also we found plastic in there. Then the issue become international and global, and United Nations adopt it so that the whole world must talk about plastic. So we have to do this. That's why 2012, I'm in UPN calculating 26,000 students. If 10,000 students take that, plastic bottle every day where they throw. So 2012, we start analyze this and making some research in the university how to solve this problem. Majority students said, if you get something, we will do it. So we had to pay them to reduce the plastic. But I didn't do that. What I did in the university, we proposed to the management of the university, transfer the student 
to the different colleges, residential colleges, so that they walk to the faculty. They walk for their lecture, right? And there are no buses. When we propose bicycle to be used on campus, then how to rent a bicycle? You can read recycle to cycle, you can Google now. Recycle to cycle UPM. You will get the whole story. Thank you, Coca Cola, for sponsoring this idea. And then we do it until today. So, this is what we need education, awareness, then practice. Follow through that parallel with the research. Then we can find something. We can help all those uh, manufacturers, for example, for their creativity and innovation so that uh, we can uh, practice better in terms of managing plastic. I agree with Dr. Nago. Uh, managing is important. You go to shop, you see everything plastic. Ladies, from the wake up to before go to bed, plastic. Men also, same thing. So if the whole family have knowledge, awareness and practice, I think we can, we can do it first round. Thank you. I just want to expand on this very quickly. Recently, the Singapore government made a statement because they have one of the member of parliament pushing for um, a ban on plastic bags and so on and so forth. The Singapore government took a very different stand to say, no, we are not going to implement a policy. It's not policy that makes it work. It's education that makes it work. That concurs with what you've just stated. We have been to Japan on uh, week-long studies about looking at their waste management system, particularly in respect of plastics. They don't have a problem with waste management there simply because of education and awareness. That's why when we discuss the matter with MassTech and the idea and proposal come with on the uh, question of a back tax, a levy, we subscribe to that. We supported that and we believe that that would be good because the intention is to collect this levy, use it to then finance and promote awareness and so on and so forth. We believe education is the key to the solution. Thank you. Okay, so uh, at some of our previous uh, events, we've had panels on biomaterials and that is obviously a hot topic um, of the current policy and also Globally, um, California actually banned uh, the use of biodegradables because of essentially the fraud, fraudulent nature of labeling uh, on material that was biodegradable or was supposed to be biodegradable but was not. Uh, there's two, a few types of biodegradable or plant-based material. One can be used purposely to be degraded and composted, or uh, the other one is meant to be recycled, like the Coke plant bottle is not meant to be degraded, but meant to be recycled. So if you take this as a version bio material 1.0, with a lot of confusion, and if you look into the future and you think, why are we having biomaterial in the first place? Is the goal to reduce our need for petroleum-based product? Is that, is that one reason? Or is the other reason because of waste management is not good enough and we hope that these things can just dissolve away in a much faster time with less damage than the other previous materials? So if we fast forward to Bio 2.0, which is probably not gonna be coming from a food grade uh, material, but it might be from algae and might be from something that is not uh, impeding with a food source. Uh, what would Bio 2.0 look like in your brain? Um, and you can jump as far into the future as you want and how this can be used. Yeah, thank you. I mean, in our roadmap, I think Dato Lim made a reference that we are trying to promote in the phase two, which is 2022, the possibility of biobacks coming into the market. But we are also co taking cognizance that the science is divided on biomaterial. Some say it degrade, some say they don't. And so we are still doing a lot of research on it. And Malaysia is a mega diverse country. We are blessed with amazing biodiversity. So we've got a lot of biomaterial to be used. And no secret, we are one of the biggest producers of oil palm. And oil palm has got waste. And that waste has got potential to be used as feedstock for biopolymer production 
with the intervention of microorganisms and all that for producing PHAs and all that. So that's something that we are quite excited about. Uh, and we like to advance the science in that using our biomass waste. Uh, we do not want to, of course, and that's clear, not using food to compete with producing biomaterials or biofuels. So that's something that we think as a country we've got a strategic position uh, using our oil palm waste. I think that's a general um, generalization in terms of using a plant-based uh, food source for the, for, to create bioplastic. But put it this way, I think, um, I, I think or, or rather, we, we turn to bioplastic because we want to reduce our dependence on oil base, right, which we consider you know, non-renewable resource. Right, because it's a limited, it takes you know, maybe hundreds, thousands of years to, 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 to create the crude oil that's needed for oil today. But then again, um, you know, it's like, but plant, you know, plant is the source of many things that we use today, right? It is like the default, not a renewable choice of material. So I think, again, that's a bit of a generalization that we shouldn't be using plants, okay? But rather, I think, um, um, you know, it's like maybe the alternative, uh, more specific choices, in this case, oil palm, right, that can be used uh, and is harvested locally as well. I think that reduces the LCA. Uh, interestingly, I used to run a palm oil mill. Seriously. Uh, in the palm oil mill process, you get what is known as FFB, which is fresh fruit punches. You put it into a sterilizer, you sterilize it, it goes through a screw and press. You get your oil, you get your palm kernel, you get fibers, and you, of course, get what is known as POMI, which is palm oil mill effluent. Uh, this thing, by the way. Now, that becomes a problem within the industry. In fact, the industry is trying to convert a waste, which is a problem, into something good. Uh, last I heard is that it is still work in progress. Uh, I've left the industry for more than 20 years. Uh, during my time, we wanted to find value to it rather than have a problem with it. Um, trying to create something from biomass, you will get something. That's a fact. But the limitation of this is the commercial viability of it because a fermentation process takes a long time. Scalability is a big issue. Palm oil mills are located far from town. So resources are more difficult to exploit. It's there, it's always difficult to exploit. Case in point, all palm oil mills have excess capacity for generating electricity. They have far in access to the requirement. That would have become what we call a fit-in tariff, FIT, that can connect to the grid. But the reality is that they are so far away from the grid that it doesn't make sense to use it. So in the same way, yes, Malaysia is blessed with a lot of uh, this uh, uh, biomass. And reality is that this has been tried to be exploited for years. Uh, we are still, unfortunately, far from that. A proposal that we can consider, and I've seen this type of proposal, is Seaweeds. Seaweeds thrive in this country simply because you have seawater and you have sunlight. And there are plants that are generating uh, things that come out with this carbon dioxide. Now, if you release the carbon dioxide into the air, it will be harmful. If you pump this and bubble it through seaweed, you will accelerate the growth of the seaweed, getting rid of a problem and uh, creating a solution. Maybe that might be something that's worth considering. Uh, again, I think we need to do a detailed research on this before we talk about biodegradable, compostable, whatever. Depending on why we talk about biodegradable. Maybe we are looking at a single-use plastic. When we throw it away, then they are not biodegradable. We have a problem with environment and eaten by animal or whatever. Why we use the plastic? Or we change another way, don't use a plastic. Why? I mean, the single-use plastic. Because it's, if you do the biodegradable, I think how strong is the bag? The lifestyle maybe need to be changed, right? I always say to the, the, the public, during my talk on campaign and recycle and so on, um, when you want to go to supermarket to buy many things, of course you plan. And I talk to the taxi group, how you can help people so that people don't use a single-use plastic bag. Then, uh, 
provide another alternative. Right? Biodegradable bag usually is not that strong as what we are having now. And we need more technology, more ideas, uh, creativity, so that we can change the quality. Uh, if you put the quality, I don't think they are uh, composed at the same time as what biodegradable. Right? So uh, lifestyle is more important. You see, eh? we cannot think my thinking, we cannot think stereotype. We have to we have some uh, ways uh, to, to practice life. Lifestyle is very important. We cannot avoid from not using plastic, but through our lifestyle, we can limit, we can manage, right? So uh, we want to do it quick. As a nature naturalist, I'm the president of Malaysian Nature Society in Malaysia. I have a lot of pressure on single-use plastic. So I want to do it quick. If I can today, no plastic at all, because it go to the, the sea and create a problem. Right? Every one, one fish out of 10, or 20, I will find some plastic material in the fish. Right? So I will say no. But research has to be, need to be continued. If you are interested in bioplastic, you can do research. People from tapioca industry came to see me to promote the product. You can eat with the plate. But I don't want to eat the plate. I just want to eat the food. <laughs> so this is our culture. I just want to drink the water, not Cups. So this is this is the thing that that we need to think along. Uh, which one is priority? Right? We have a better priority education awareness and changing our lifestyle rather than uh, spend million to develop a uh, bioplastic or whatever degradable plastic. Thank you. Great. I think we have time for one quick question. Does anyone have something burning issue? Ben's got the microphone. Afternoon, after lunch, bio materials. Anyone? Um, what? What? There's one here. The lucky. Thank you. Hi. Um, I, again, in the Malaysian context, uh, now that we have the roadmap and it seems like we are going on biodegradables and all. So I would like to ask do we settle the composting facility first or do we kick off the biodegradable materials first? That's a great question and that's what a lot of cities are facing right now, that, that debate. And it's a chicken and egg. What, what do you think on the panel? I can be ready in half a year, just saying. <laughs> I think the reality is that there are lots of composting stations that have been built that have, what I've just stated earlier, that rejects plastic bags because it takes six months to degrade. Uh, food waste is not a problem. So you will have a situation where it will not be sent to the composting stations because they are rejected. I think just a quick reaction. I mean, while the roadmap says we might, not might, we're going to embrace bioplastics, but that's not for certain, right? Because it's, it's bonded by the science. So if we are still uncertain about the science of biodegradability of biobags bio or whatever, we might not even introduce them. I mean, you see, it's like it's a living document. Because every other day we are learning new things, new products are coming. So, but to answer your question, I think this roadmap also is not championed by a single ministry. It's a roadmap every one of us should champion. So we've got our colleagues in Ministry of Housing and Local Government also looking at issues of integrated waste management. Because I think you made a... Good point. Uh, without a composting facility, it's pointless to come out with all these uh, bio-alternatives. Thank you. Uh, can I, I always go? Uh, yeah, maybe parallel. <laughs> uh, maybe good question, you know, because uh, we are talking about that topic. Why don't we have another technology to solve everything? Government propose separate at home. I mean, separate at source plastic and non-plastic. What, what are the initiatives? You put in a black bag, put it outside, and then everybody knows what happened next. End up with landfill site or recycle center, right? I remember when I lived in England a long time ago, there were four bins. Before I left England, two bins left. I don't know how many now. 
Right? Why? Because people don't have time. Many people come here today. How many, what time you came here today? Six o'clock, seven o'clock, still dark. You go back at night to sleep, uh, tired and sleep. During weekend, you have another activities. Right? People don't have time. So why don't we put a technology that you, they can bring all of your uh, domestic waste to one factory and at that factory, they separate everything and then do it what you say, composting, recycle, reuse, or whatever, the factory do it for you. I think they have been done it in Europe, for example. Why don't we do it in Malaysia? Malaysia is still fighting for landfill site. Sanitary landfill site, collecting rubbish, road um, uh, uh, damages by the heavy lorry overweight. So that's uh, still, talking, still talking about that. So I propose, Mr. Nago, we propose this high-tech uh, solution for this, including plastic compost, 40% of our food waste, why we are wasting a lot of food, I don't know. So this is the thing that we need food priority, I think. Yeah, I'll just respond with, I mean, the high tech is actually important, but I think the high tech is each and every one of us. I think one thing that we realize in Malaysia, this knowledge, attitude, practice, many of them have spoken about awareness. I think Malaysians are very highly aware about the impacts on environment. What's not happening is changes to attitude, and practices. I'll be here till the whole evening. Anybody who could give us a silver bullet or a single bullet on how to change attitude and practices, we'd be very happy to listen. And I, something that's not happening. Thank you. Well, I think uh, that's a great way to end. And remember that he made a few key comments that this is a living document. Yeah. And I think that's important. So thank you very much to our panelists today. Thank you.